morning, everyone. Um, is this working? No, it's not. Hello, yes. Is this working? I can't tell. It's not. Hello, yes, that is working. Uh, good morning, Anthony. Ro I am welcome to today's press conference at the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. I'm Anthony Rowley, first vice president of the club, and it's my pleasure today to act as moderator and to introduce our guest, who is His Excellency Paul Madden, who is ambassador of the United Kingdom to Japan. Um, he's going to address us today on the subject of global Britain global Japan, shared values and shared future. Uh, obviously, we're hoping he'll talk a little bit about another subject too, which begins with B. Um, Ambassador Madden was actually involved uh, some years ago in the talks on the enlargement of the European Union, and sadly, unfortunately, we're now seeing that process going into reverse with um, Britain exiting. Um, Ambassador Madden is a distinguished career diplomat who became Britain's ambassador to Japan in January of this year. Although he was originally posted at the Japanese Embassy in Japan as First Secretary in 1988. He was previously British High Commissioner uh, to Australia and from, from 2011 to 2015, and British High Commissioner to Singapore from 2007 to 2011. He also had a spell at the British Embassy in Washington. Prior to that, he served as Managing Director of um, the then uh, Export Promotion Agency, Official Export Promotion Agency, UK Trade and Investment, where he was responsible for coordinating and implementing international trade and development policies in support of companies across a wide range of business affairs. And he was for two years a Minister's Private Secretary. Ambassador Madden has a degree in geography, uh, economic geography, I should say, from the University of Cambridge, an MBA from the at University of Durham. So, um, as time is limited, I will lim limit myself the introduction to that. I'll hand over to Ambassador Madden, but can I remind you, those of you who have cell phones, please switch them off or put them on silent mode as a courtesy to our guest. So, please enjoy, uh, join me in welcoming Ambassador Madden. Um, is there a podium? There is a podium, just here. Oh, okay, yes, sure. Well, good morning, everybody. It's very nice to be here, and it's good to see so many of you here. It's quite a contrast to a talk which I was asked to give uh, at Drafty Church Hall in the north of England a few years ago, when the audience consisted of about two men and a dog. And the, the chairman began his introduction of me by attacking the audience. And he said to them, look, if more of you don't come to these meetings, we'll never get a decent speaker. Well, you can imagine how that left me feeling. Well, as you've just heard, I've been back in Japan since January this year, and it's the country where I began my diplomatic life, where we began our married life, and where we had our first child. So coming back here brings back many happy memories. I was here at the start of the Heisei era, and of course I'll be here at the start of a, a new exciting era in due course. The late 80s and the early 90s was a fascinating time to be in Japan. The bubble economy was in full swing. There was a big expansion in Koksai car, the internationalization, and Japanese companies were pouring overseas, snapping up foreign companies and assets. It was the beginning of a hugely successful investment relationship with the United Kingdom, which I'll talk about later. And ordinary Japanese were venturing abroad in large numbers as students and as tourists, many for the first time. But many corners of the Japanese economy at that time remained inward looking and protectionist, and that's changed. And my Japanese friends all had to work incredibly hard, and many thought they'd never be able to afford to own their own home in Tokyo. During that time, in my first day, I was Will Adams at Ito City's uh, annual Mura Anjin Festival. I did a three-month attachment to uh, METI, or MITI as it was then known, and I helped to develop a twinning relationship between my hometown in England and a small town in the Japanese Alps in Nagano-ken. I traveled to more than 40 of the Tudofu-ken, and this time I intend to do them all. 
In the 25 years whilst I was away from Japan since my last posting, I've continued to visit from time to time for business and pleasure. I was responsible for the uh, UK Pavilion at the Aichi Expo in 2005. And I have spent much of that time around the Asia-Pacific region, um, most recently, as you heard, as ambassador in Australia and in Singapore. So I kept in touch with what was going on here in Japan. Coming back to actually live here again, I can see many changes. Some of the buzz of the bubble, the bubble jidai has moved on, but Japan remains a huge, successful, dynamic economy. And my impression is that most ordinary Japanese people live perhaps more contented lives with more free time to spend with partners and families and better access to a much wider range of goods and services. But fortunately, some things haven't changed. Japan still has a, a strong sense of its history and culture. And I was reminded of that uh, quite recently when I attended a presentation by a British company um, their consumer insights team was talking about how the Japanese consumers work and what their preferences are. And it was interesting to see that they linked many of them back to Japan's cultural traditions. Japan, of course, remains a, a very safe, convenient, and easy place to live. And, of course, Google Maps have helped a lot. In fact, it's such a pleasant place to live that many Westerners that I knew here 25 years ago are still here. They originally came for a short posting, but often married Japanese and settled down. And who can blame them? Maybe Japan is almost too comfortable. When I talk to young Brits who are teaching in schools around the country when I go on my travels, they tell me that young Japanese are less interested in going abroad to study or work than they used to be. And that's borne out by the statistics. I suppose it's a good thing to feel contented in your own country. But personally, I do feel that spending time overseas doesn't just help you to understand other countries. It helps you to understand and appreciate your own country better, too. But I am slightly encouraged by recent data, which suggests that there has been a modest increase in the number of young Japanese people who are choosing to study in the UK. Japan is, of course, ahead of most of us on facing the demographic challenges of advanced societies. Uh, as I say to our visitors when they come through, that may not be so apparent in the major cities like Tokyo and Osaka, which still seem packed with vibrant youth culture. But as I've travelled around the country to smaller towns and rural areas, I've heard about falling school roles and urban, urban migration. Demography is a, a very much a challenge that we all share, and so we all have a lot to, to learn from each other, but Japan is a little further down the, the time curve on that. Also, since I was last posted in Japan, the country has suffered some major natural disasters. So I made a point of making one of my very first visits out of Tokyo after I arrived, of going to Fukushima. I visited the mayor of Minami Soma, uh, one of the towns which had been devastated by the tsunami. And I paid my respects to those who lost their lives there. I visited some of the uh, reconstructed housing. And I also visited the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station and I met some of the workers who'd worked so hard to stabilize the, the reactors there. And the British government, researchers, British business, have been working very closely to support uh, Japan's nuclear industry through this difficult time. Only a couple of weeks ago, Japanese researchers were in Fukushima working together with UK researchers on uh, new robotics and ultrasound technology. More recently, I was in Kumamoto uh, inspecting the damage from last year's earthquake with about 50 uh, direct deaths and many more related, it merited, I guess, just a brief uh, mention in the international news headlines. But a year and a half on, thousands and thousands of locals are still living in temporary housing. And to me, it was a salutary reminder of how Japan has always been much more affected by the vicissitudes of the natural environment than a country like my own, which is located in a rather more benign geographical setting. The mayor of Kumamoto told me that they aim to restore at least the central features of that magnificent castle, which is such an iconic landmark of Matsumoto, in time for 2019, when they are one of the host cities for the 2019 Rugby World Cup, which is obviously something I'll be looking forward to, as we will have three teams here that I have to cheer for. Well, it's an interesting time to be back in Japan. The relationship between our two countries continues to go from strength to strength, and there's a very busy program of exchanges across many different spheres, political, security, economic, science and innovation, education, culture. 
And it's been a particularly busy summer for my embassy. Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson was here in July, and then Prime Minister May came for a long three-day visit in August-September. She was accompanied by a business delegation and also by our International Trade Secretary, Liam Fox. And just a couple of weeks ago, I had a minister from our Treasury, our Minister for Digital Affairs, both staying with me at the same time on separate programmes. So it's been a busy, busy few months. Prime Minister May's visit was seen as highly successful by both sides really taking the bilateral relationship to the next level, as set out in the joint vision statement and its annexes, which were published at that time. It was actually her first visit to Japan, and so Prime Minister Abe invited her to begin the visit in Kyoto and to experience some Japanese culture, including a tea ceremony, before traveling up to Tokyo with him on the bullet train, which was another interesting experience for her. And so the two leaders had a lot of time together over the course of the visit. A key topic of discussion was our security relationship, and this was particularly relevant in a week when the DPRK had fired a missile that passed over Hokkaido. Prime Minister Abe invited Prime Minister May to attend Japan's National Security Council for a discussion, and she was only the second foreign leader to have been invited to do so. The two leaders issued a joint statement condemning North Korea's reckless and illegal actions and committed to working closely together at the UN and elsewhere to bring pressure to bear on Pyongyang. The situation in North Korea is clearly one of the most pressing issues of our time, with an urgent global danger in the activities of Kim Jong-un and his regime. There's an intense focus on this issue at the UN. The UN Security Council has unanimously imposed increasingly stringent sanctions on North Korea, and the UK fully supported the adoption of UN Security Council Resolution 2375, which imposes the toughest measures ever adopted by the Security Council on the DPRK. But we still need to go further. As one of the original sending states and a P5 member, the UK is committed to supporting international efforts to bring an end to the tests and to the provocations and a return to diplomacy. We have no doubt that negotiations must form part of the solution and there can be a peaceful end to the crisis. But until North Korea changes its course, we must maintain the maximum pressure possible. And there's a vital role for China and Russia, both of who are neighbors of North Korea with influence on Pyongyang and are permanent members of the Security Council. They share a special responsibility for preserving international peace and security and we have called on them both to use their influence to restrain North Korea, to support full implementation of the sanctions, and to guide the leaders of DPRK towards a peaceful resolution to this dangerous and unacceptable situation. Prime Minister May had a further opportunity to discuss our growing security cooperation on a visit to the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force's largest ship, the Izumo, at Yokosuka. On board, she met Royal Navy divers and their Japanese counterparts who had been exercising together. She also learned from the ship's cook that kare raisu is said to have been introduced into Japan from India actually via the Imperial Japanese Navy and through their close relationship with Britain's Royal Navy who had a tradition of always having an Indian chef on board their ships. Some of you may be aware that last year saw a very successful joint exercise between the Japanese Air Self-Defense Force and the British Royal Air Force's Typhoon fighter jets. This was the first time anyone other than the US had been uh, doing this in the skies above Japan. And Mrs. May announced that next year we would have British soldiers here for ground-based joint training, as well as a visit by the Royal Naval Frigate HMS Argyle. Earlier this year, we saw an excellent example of four-way cooperation when British Royal Marines aboard a French ship exercised with US and Japanese counterparts in the region. The two Prime Ministers also discussed working together to support the UN's Sustainable Development Goals and strengthening our collaboration on development issues. This includes potential collaboration on Zero Hunger, that's the second of the SDGs, where we hope to build on the Nutrition for Growth N4G campaign, which was launched at the close of the London 2012 Olympics and Paralympics. And we're also working together on the goal of gender equality. The other main theme of my Prime Minister's visit was economic issues. 
She and Mr. Abe jointly addressed a big business event with 200 participants, and she met a number of major Japanese companies who are significant investors in the UK to hear their views. She reiterated Britain's support for the early conclusion of the EU-Japan Economic Partnership Agreement, or EPA, which is currently under negotiation. And the two leaders agreed that the EPA could form the basis for a new trade agreement between Britain and Japan once the UK has left the EU. So let me say a bit more about Brexit and particularly how it plays into the UK-Japan relationship. First, a, a quick uh, reminder of the, the time frame. The British people voted on the 23rd of June last year to leave the EU. Prime Minister May set out our broad negotiating objectives in a major speech in January. And the UK formally triggered a two-year Article 50 negotiation process on the 29th of March, which means that we will formally leave the EU in March 2019. So far, four rounds of negotiations have taken place. On the 22nd of September, Mrs May made another significant speech in Florence with some more detailed thoughts on how to take the negotiations forward. And this came on top of 14 detailed papers that have been published by the UK over the last few months, covering issues from collaboration on science and innovation to citizens' rights and future partnership on law enforcement and criminal justice. Japanese people sometimes ask me why the UK chose to leave the EU. But when I describe how the British people, with our distinctive history and strong parliamentary traditions, attach importance to the decisions that affect their lives being made in the British Parliament by people who are directly accountable to them, most Japanese seem to readily understand. They tell me that Japan would never be able to accept unlimited freedom of movement of people across its borders, for example. And the model of ever closer EU integration pursued by some in Europe is a perfectly respectable aspiration but it is not one that most British people ever felt really comfortable with. But it's important to say that Britain voted to leave the EU, not to leave Europe. Our neighbours will remain close friends, allies with whom we share fundamental values, and major trading partners. Also, Britain didn't vote to turn in on itself. Indeed, our instincts as a country have always been outward-looking. Brexit, in a sense, frees us up to be even more vigorous in developing our relations with countries beyond the borders of Europe, including those countries which are seeing the fastest economic growth around the world. The Brexit vote also did not mean that Britain was turning anti-foreigner. Control over the scale and nature of immigration was part of the debate, but around every eighth person in the UK was born overseas. Part of our economic success and vitality flows from being a magnet for global talent. And businesses and universities, other organisations in the UK, will continue to have access to the talent they need to thrive. We are, and will remain, one of the most tolerant multicultural societies on earth. And we remain one of the most globally engaged powers. The UK is the only nation that meets both the UN target of spending 0.7% of its GDP on aid and the NATO target of spending 2% of GDP on defence. And of course, Britain maintains great strengths in soft power with institutions like the BBC, the British Council, our famous universities, as well as the role that London plays as one of the truly great global cities. Now, I recognise that the Brexit vote was an initial shock to many Japanese companies who've made major investments in Britain and that they remain concerned to understand what precisely the outcome of the exit negotiations will be. British ministers, I and my team here, have spent a lot of time engaging in close dialogue with individual Japanese companies and with business organisations like the Kedanran. Japanese companies have some £40 billion of FDI investment in the UK, employing 140,000 workers directly and making a major contribution to some of our most important business sectors like cars, pharma, financial services. So what are their main concerns? It depends on their sector and on the type of activity they engage in. So major manufacturers like the car makers want to know what future tariff and customs arrangements will be, both for their exports to the EU and also for their complex supply chains. 
Other industries are concerned about future regulatory issues and about access to key staff. Some companies will not be significantly affected, for example, if their main focus is on the UK domestic market or if they are using the UK as a base because of its strong links to the Middle East and Africa. Let us look at what's actually happened so far. There were some delays in uh, investment decisions amidst the initial uncertainty, but the total number of new investments from Japan last year was broadly in line with the previous period. Nissan and Toyota both went ahead with plans to announce major new investments in UK production facilities. And SoftBank, in a sign of their confidence in the UK economy, carried out a £24 billion acquisition of Arm Holdings. Some banks have announced plans to move a relatively small proportion of their London-based activity to continental Europe to comply with passporting requirements. But they remain committed to the huge strengths of London as a global financial hub. In her Florence speech, Mrs May reiterated that the UK recognises that the EU single market is built on a balance of rights and obligations, and that the UK cannot accept all of these obligations, so we need to find a new way of working together in partnership as we leave the single market and we leave the customs union. A new relationship which ensures that we continue to retain the best possible tariff-free access to the single market and frictionless borders. She made clear that we don't think it is appropriate to adopt an existing off-the-shelf relationship like those uh, which are often described, um, for example, Canada or Norway, because we're not starting with a blank sheet of paper. We are starting from a position where the UK has the same rules and regulations as our European partners. So it should be possible to achieve a unique and ambitious future partnership that is in the best interests of everyone. The Prime Minister also recognised that businesses and individuals need time to adjust so that they understand what the new arrangements are going to be and there shouldn't be a cliff edge at the point of departure. She stressed the importance of a strictly time-limited implementation period, which is expected to be around two years. And I know this um, was welcomed by Japanese business. Of course, many of the UK's competitive strengths, which have contributed to our success in attracting Japanese investment over the last few decades, will remain unchanged by Brexit. Our business-friendly environment, our highly skilled, flexible labour market, our low corporate tax rates, 19% going down to 17% by 2020, and the strong research base in some of the world's top universities. I mentioned earlier our growing security cooperation with Japan. Britain has, of course, had a major long-standing security alliance with our European neighbours and with the US. Prime Minister May made it clear in her speech that that will continue. She said that the UK is unconditionally committed to maintaining Europe's security. Indeed, even as the Brexit negotiations continue, our military are actively engaged on the EU's eastern flanks in supporting our friends and allies. Japan is a partner with which we share many values. Democracy, human rights, rule of law, free and open markets. And we work together in support of these all around the world. For example, we've been cooperating particularly closely in New York during Japan's current spell on the UN Security Council. And with our significant aid programs, we are both helping developing nations to tackle some of the biggest global challenges like poverty, health and climate change. I don't want to stretch the old line about us both being island nations with long histories too far, but I do think there are some similarities in our approach which help us work effectively together. Increasingly, societies like Britain and Japan face threats beyond the traditional security ones in terms of things like terrorism and cyber attacks. And these are areas where it is essential for governments to work closely together. During Prime Minister May's recent visit, the two leaders agreed to strengthen our cooperation in counter-terrorism and in cyber, and in particular against the backdrop of the 2019 Rugby World Cup and the 2020 Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics. Both leaders also announced that we will present a UK season of culture in Japan, running from 2019 to 2020, between those two major sporting events. 
building on the strong cultural relationship that already exists between the UK and Japan. The season will raise awareness of UK arts and culture in Japan and develop new connections and opportunities for both. There will in, this will include world-famous British institutions and artists visiting Japan. The season will also aim, enable UK artists and organisations to work with Japanese partners to share knowledge about Japan's digital technology, including virtual reality and robots. Indeed, more generally, I see the Olympics and the Paralympics as an area with scope for us to do much more together. Building on the experiences that Britain gained in hosting the hugely successful 2012 London Games. I think Japan is going to put on a fantastic event that will be a major showcase for this country and a reminder to the world of the great strengths that Japan possesses as a society. No doubt we'll see innovative Japanese technologies on display following the path cut by the bullet train in 1964. And if London is anything to go by, the Paralympics will be an enormous opportunity to transform the way ordinary people think about their fellow citizens with disabilities. So I'm personally really pleased that Tokyo 2020 will happen during my time as ambassador here. I'm still at a relatively early uh, stage in my posting, but at such an exciting time for Japan and for the UK-Japan relationship, I'm really looking forward to the next four years here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, before I open the floor to general questions, I'd like to ask you one quick question myself, which is you gave a very reassuring um, view of the uh, continuing economic relationship between Japan and, um, and Britain, but presumably the uh, commitment of Japanese business to Britain will depend very much on the quality of the trade agreement that Britain is able to secure with um, the European Union. How confident are you that Britain will be able to um, secure an agreement which still makes it an attractive platform for investment from uh, Japan and other countries? Thank you. Well, the, the first thing uh, I would say is that all the Japanese companies we talk to are very committed to their investments in the UK and the experience they've had there. Um, the almost universal message is we really want to stay in Britain so please make sure that the eventual agreement enables us to do so. And we are confident that the um, negotiating objectives that the Prime Minister has set out uh, are achievable. Of course it's a negotiation so you'll hear lots of rhetoric around the negotiations from, from all sides. But I think the thing that uh, gives me most confidence is that the things that we are actually putting forward as the relationship that we want to continue with the best possible access and trade between uh, the UK and the EU is not just something that's in the best interest of Britain, it's actually in the best interest of our EU partners as well because they have massive trade flows and investments each way. So it's in their best interest too. And of course if something works for Britain and it works for our EU partners, by definition it will also work uh, for Japanese companies and Japanese investors. Okay, thank you. Um, questions first from the working press. Do we have any questions from the working press? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Justin McCurry from The Guardian. Uh, Ambassador, thanks very much for coming. Um, just as a uh, a follow-on from Anthony's question, really. Uh, it's been almost a year and a half, uh, I think, since the EU, EU referendum, and the talks in Brussels don't appear to have made much progress. We have David Davis coming back from Brussels saying all is well, and then we have EU officials saying quite the opposite. Um, we have Theresa May saying one thing, and then Boris Johnson popping up in The Sun or The, the Times saying something quite different. So. When you talk to Japanese government officials and uh, Japanese business leaders and they ask you, so Ambassador, how are the Brexit talks going? What do you tell them and um, how convinced are, they, are you that when you uh, give them an update on the state of Brex Brexit talks that they're reassured by what's happening in Brussels? Thank you. 
Thank you. Well, I think the, the Japanese government and Japanese business will, of course, want to talk to everyone. They'll talk to the UK side of the process, and they'll talk to the EU side of the process, and then they'll formulate their own views of what makes sense. Um, and both the Japanese government and the Japanese business community also take opportunities not just to listen but to tell us what they would like to see and they use those opportunities to tell the EU side what they would like to see too. Um, as I said, it's a negotiating process and of course there's going to be language around expectations on all sides. Um, we triggered the Article 50 negotiations in March and we're only in September, so in those six months we've had four rounds of negotiations. There is quite a lot of work going on. We actually have a senior official from our department for exiting the EU in Japan this week and he's um, meeting various interlocutors in Japan, government and business and so on, um, talking them through some of the things that are going on. I think what um, Theresa May was doing in her uh, Florence speech was trying to set the context of how we move forward through the next stage of the negotiations. Um, she was trying to reassure the European partners on some of the issues that they were particularly concerned about and trying to reassure um, business and, and, and other economic players. So the transitional period, the implementation period which she described, I think is, is helpful in that context. I think some of the reassurance that she has given uh, around the UK contributions to the budget were also so seen as, as helpful. So effectively there are two processes. There's a process of discussing what will be the departure terms and then there's a process of discussing what will be the future relationship. Um, I think the EU took a view that we have to get the first one completely out of the way before we start on the second. We've made some progress on that but we're hoping now that we're going to be able to start the second because at the end of the day everything, as, as, as all those of you who, who do deals know, at the end of the day, the deal is not a deal until everything's agreed. But I think we are um, moving into an increasingly uh, positive space where things are moving forward. Okay, any more questions from the working press? If not, um, do we have any other questions from other members? Um, yes, does it, please. Uh, my name is Hiro Kujita, a freelance freelancer with the uh, Yukan Fujita Evening Newspaper. Um, I'm meeting the uh, former US uh, Commander Chief at the Pacific Fleet uh, in about two weeks, spending about a week with him. So I'm gonna, uh, not going to deny Japan's security pact, but as you just mentioned, Japan has a lot more common character, history, tradition with the uh, uh, your country. So, can't we think of any uh, development of the, the Anglo Japanese or uh, you know, UK Japanese uh, military alliance or intelligence alliance? Thank you. Uh, well, I, I certainly wouldn't suggest that the UK in any way can supplant the enormous presence which the, the US has in this country and across this, this region. Clearly, the areas that we will work with Japan on are going to be, uh, in terms of practical, in a practical sense, are going to be much more in niche areas where we've got particular experiences to bring. So one example of that is the area around um, something called amphibiosity, which um, those of you who know about um, navies and marine forces will, will, will understand. And there are some areas where, because the UK is more or less of comparable size in military terms to Japan, uh, that it's easier for us to to um, cooperate together on a, on a, a small scale, whereas when Japan is working with the U.S., uh, they're working with a very large organisation. So, in particular areas, you will see us strengthening our cooperation together, um, and not just in the conventional defence, but as I said, in areas like counterterrorism, uh, in areas like cyber security. So I think you are going to see an intensification of us doing things together because our starting point is that we share very similar values and we share very similar interests. Uh, the fact that there is less uh, war fighting going on in the Middle East means that we have a little bit more flexibility now for deployments. And so I think you will see more of that going forward. We have a, a annual meeting structure, or which we call the 2 plus 2 of our foreign and defense ministers. And uh, we're hoping that the next meeting of that will take place before the end of this year, which will follow on and put more detail on some of the things that the two prime ministers agreed uh, when they met uh, earlier this, uh, last month. Thank you. Um, <coughs> one more question for me, if I may, which is 
Japan has a, a very great manufacturing tradition, which uh, Britain also has or had. Um, at this time, it seems that China and Germany are rather moving rather close in the sense of combining their industrial resources, especially through the OBOR project. Do you think there's any scope in the future for Japan and Britain to in some way combine their manufacturing traditions in, in, in a way that takes advantage of natural resources in other countries, which they're both very good at turning into high value added products? Is there any thought along those lines in Britain? Well, of course, we do have a very strong uh, connection in a manufacturing sense with, between um, Britain and Japan in terms of the Japanese manufacturing investments which are in the UK. And uh, before coming out here as an ambassador, I visited a number of those plants. And I was very pleased to hear that in, in many cases, the, the local management were telling me that when the Japanese parent company rank the competitiveness and productivity of their global operation, those UK plants came out right at the, at the very top. So I think that, that shows that although Britain is an economy that's 80% services now, in particular manufacturing sectors, particularly obviously high-tech manufacturing sectors, we've still got considerable strengths. And so that does offer us lots of opportunities to, to work uh, together with Japan, um, not just in manufacturing but in, in the services sector too. And, uh, Prime Minister Abe has talked um, a lot recently about his free and open um, Indo-Pacific partnership concept, and that's something that, that we're very interested in. Uh, but in essence, um, some of that is about working together in developing the um, infrastructure projects and others in developing countries. These are often countries where we both have um, significant aid programs. Um, in some cases, they're countries where Britain has got long-standing historical traditions too, so we have something to, to bring to the table. So I think this is an area of working together in third countries that we would like to do more of. Interesting. Sorry, the Indo-Pacific partnership is is what I, f I forgive my ignorance, but I'm not quite clear on the what is that. Uh, uh, well, it's a Japanese proposal, so you'd have to ask the Japanese really. But it's um, I think it's essentially a concept that actually people have tended to talk about Asia Pacific, but actually if you look. Uh, across the world where some of the areas of most growth are now, you need to take in a sweep across the Indian Ocean that brings in the Indian subcontinent and parts of Africa too. More questions, please. I'm sure someone has a question. I take advantage of this opportunity. Um, well, yes, does it, please. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. I have one specific, but my name is Kurt Sieber, I'm an associate member. Uh, my, <clears throat> my question is particularly about Ireland. How do you see the future relationship between the Republic of Ireland and North uh, Ireland? And uh, if I'm on the subject, uh, as we all know, uh, S Scotland was not very... Um, enthusiastic about leaving the EU. What is the present situation uh, uh, in Scotland in respect to the Brexit situation? Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me take the, the Irish uh, one first. Uh, yes, the UK's decision to leave the EU has uh, enormous implications for Ireland. Ireland is a country, it's the only um, European partner with which we have a land border. It's a country with which we have uh, an enormous um, trading relationship, uh, but it's a country with which we also have a, a, a hugely deep um, human relationship. I think it used to be the case, they, they used to say that every sixth person uh, in Britain had a, a grandparent born in Ireland. I think that's changed a bit with migration patterns over the last couple of decades, but the, the, the intimate personal relationships between Britain and Ireland remain very deep and very strong. Um, so it's an important priority for, for, for us, for Britain, for Ireland and for the rest of the EU that we get the right relationship with Ireland. An economic relationship that allows those trade flows to continue and it's not just trade, people move backwards and forwards across the border, many of them between their, their, their homes and their places of work. We want to see that able to continue. There's also um, a particular issue that is because of the uh, troubles uh, in Ireland, which persisted for several decades after the 60s, or intensified for several decades after the 60s, and which um, 
thankfully were um, brought more or less to a close by the Good Friday Agreement. Um, we no longer have a physical border at all between uh, the UK and Ireland, and it would be very detrimental to the inter-community relations if such a border to, were to be restored. So it's a big priority for both sides that we don't see that happening. And uh, uh, the, I the Irish government have been very supportive to the UK throughout the, the process so far, and we'll look forward to working very closely with them to achieve that. Uh, on the Scottish issue, well, Scotland had a, its own a referendum about leaving the UK a couple of years ago. Um, it was defeated. The majority of the Scottish people decided they wanted to stay part of the UK. There have been um, some comments from those who support uh, Scotland leaving the rest of the UK that the Brexit decision changes the game and that there should be uh, another referendum. In fact, I think um, the opinion polling suggests that um, if there was another referendum, um, the result would be more or less the same. Scotland would certainly still decide to stay as part of the UK. In fact, in the most recent UK general elections, the party for leaving, the Scottish Nationalist Party, lost votes to the, the, the other parties. And then finally, in terms of uh, economic, the, the economic backdrop, um, particularly the, the current state of the oil price, makes it a less attractive, less viable uh, proposition for Scotland to be uh, setting itself up as a, a, as a separate entity. So I think for all of those reasons, I think that's rather off the table for the moment. You mentioned another referendum in, uh, in Scotland, but what if there were another referendum in UK on, on Brexit? Do you think it would still go the same way today as it did last year? That's what the opinion polling would suggest, yeah. Yes. Um, just one thing, you, I think you, you said, I, I hope I'm not misquoting, you said that a, a few institutions, financial institutions, were uh, planning to leave the City of London, but passporting rights into the city are very important um, to many banks. Do you think Britain will be able to secure some sort of passporting rights um, that will still attract uh, um, Japanese and other banks and financial institutions to come to London or to remain in London? Will that kind of agreement be possible? So precisely what the end shape of the agreement will look like on financial services, I, I don't think I could predict. So uh, there, there are all sorts of ways you can do these things. There are things around equivalence where uh, you may not have uh, identical agreements, but you recognize that each other's um, prudential and supervisory arrangements are, are um, equivalent and therefore acceptable. Um, but we, we understand that the Japanese companies may, in some cases, need to open a new office um, in an EU country if they don't already have a subsidiary there. Many of them do have subsidiaries there and that they may need to move some of their customer facing activities and, and we've been seeing some of that activity. For the most part it's, it's maybe less than 10% of their total presence in London and much of the back office work will still continue to be done in the UK. Um, most experts I talk to in the financial services sector, Japanese banks and institutions, um, talk about the, the huge agglomeration of supporting infrastructure and soft infrastructure and all the professional services which, um, which exist around uh, London, which actually is an asset not just to Britain, it's an asset to the whole of the EU. It enables um, companies and individuals around the uh, European Union to finance their business activities and their personal lives in ways that are more efficient uh, and more cost effective than they would be without uh, having a major financial services hub. Uh, within the within the within Europe, so I think for all those reasons of agglomeration, um, it's not fundamentally going to change the the role that London plays as a significant financial centre. And many people in the industry also say that to the extent uh, there are um, there is movement of business away from London, it's more likely to go to New York than to some of the other European centres, which are, are of course much smaller. Mm. All right, thank you, uh, Joan. Hello, uh, Joan Anderson working with Soka Gakkai International and an associate member and a Scot. Um, so my question relates to your comment about Britain being you know, one of the most tolerant and multicultural societies. And I, I was just back home, um, actually in England this time, uh, last, the last few weeks, and I think about five or six people who are not 
maybe were not born in Britain but now have British, British citizenship or live there mentioned to me that they have been experiencing out and out racism, um, which they had never experienced before and are feeling extremely unwelcome in Britain. And I also know of other people who, for instance, in the place where my mother lives, some of the staff have left who were from Europe. And, and just this general feeling that, that, yes, Britain is not now so welcoming to foreigners is, I think, of great concern. So does the government have steps to you know, address this, and also as a suggestion, maybe if the season, UK season of culture is happening here, perhaps we could try to, or you could try to include some representation of the multicultural nature of Britain in that program. I think that would be a very interesting um, idea. Anyway, thank you. Well, I think it's inconceivable that anything that was representing British culture wouldn't be multicultural nowadays. Um, I think one of the strong impressions that most um, outside observers will have from the um, London 2012 Olympics and Paralympics was the extent to which modern Britain is a, a, a multicultural society, a vibrant multicultural society. If you look at the if you look at the, the images of the Brits who stood on the rosters to get their gold medals, look at where they came from. Um, of course you can always pull out examples of people who may have had difficult individual experiences and I guess there have been more active, um, atten more actively attention has been drawn to some of those things in the debates around the EU. But I've lived in lots of countries in the world, and I can honestly say, not just not because I'm a government representative, there are few places on earth more tolerant than Britain. And we are a society where every eighth person was born in another country. How many other countries can you say that about, and where it has worked so relatively successfully? Um, of course, immigration was one of the issues. It was a backdrop to the Brexit vote. Uh, and in some cases, it was less about the, the fact of immigration. Forms. It was about the scale and the pace at which it was happening, because right across Europe, and it's not at all a, a phenomenon limited to Britain, right across Europe, we've seen waves of people coming um, both those coming from, for example, the Middle East and Africa, um, fleeing um, civil instability, wars, um, poverty, um, some of them actually fleeing things, some seeking um, further economic opportunities. We've also seen, particularly since the, uh, the group of uh, countries from Central and Eastern Europe joined the EU in, I think, 2004, we've seen major movements of um, particularly young people um, seeking jobs in the, um, the larger, richer member states, and Britain's certainly seen a, a, a lot of that. And for the most part, that's, that's gone very smoothly. I mean, we absor absorbed hundreds of thousands of Poles, for example, who make a huge contribution to our economy. So I don't think that Britain has turned particularly anti-foreigner. Uh, I don't think that um, we will stop being a country that welcomes people from all over the world um, if they have the talents that, that, that we need. Um, I don't think uh, the government has all sorts of policies to um, to uh, promote our multicultural society. We have some policies which are around efforts to tackle some of the causes of terrorism. I don't want to make an explicit link between terrorism and, and immigration because uh, the, the, the number of people who are perpetrators of terrorism across Europe is absolutely tiny compared to the, the, the populations who've, who've moved around um, from other parts of the world to, to Europe. But there, so there are, certainly we have policies in place to promote that, but I think in general, I think our record is, is as good as anyone's and better than most on, on multiculturalism. Um, one of the areas where Britain, I think, still does excel, if that's the right word, is in its academic universities, its academic achievements. Um, and of course, it, it, that those focus very much on, on what are known as the humanities, whereas Japan seems to be moving increasingly towards a university system that focuses on science, technology, and so on. Uh, and some people argue this is rather short-sighted and narrow-minded because it doesn't produce the kind of people who actually can innovate. Do you have any comments on that, whether you think Japan is perhaps should take more uh, uh, a lesson from UK, as it were, in st stressing the humanities in, in university education? 
Thank you. Well, I, I'm actually in a good place to answer that question because we have the British government's chief scientific advisor visiting Japan at the moment. And I hosted a dinner for him last night with a bunch of leading scientists from Japanese universities. So we had quite a lively debate around that. I, mean, I, I would disagree with the first part of your proposition, which is that uh, British universities are strong in humanities. They're also very strong in sciences too. I think one college at Cambridge, um, Trinity College, has more Nobel Prizes than China and Russia put together. Um, we win Nobel Prizes in, in right across the science, and they're very strong. Um, in the world's uh, top ten universities, three are British. Last year it was four. Um, none of the others are European. So I think that shows that there are great strengths in our, um, in our university system and in our R&D base. Um, in terms of Japan's strengths in science, yes, it's... Um, the Japanese education system does tend to produce people uh, who are more likely to be specialized in sciences and that's been an enormous strength for Japan when you look at the the the, the strengths of its its economy in terms of um, high technology and that will be even more important going forward uh, with the demographic challenges that there'll need to be technological solutions to that but I think in fact most of the Japanese scientists who were there last night uh, were saying that um, it is also going to be very important for Japan to develop um, more people with soft skills and the kind of things that come from liberal arts traditions alongside the science. In fact, one of the researchers was saying that in future with artificial intelligence, that you'll, you'll have computers and robots which are able to do the research themselves. So it's actually going to be more about the soft skills, about how you put the, that research and innovation into practice for the good of our economies and the good of our societies. So I think Japan's got a lot to be proud of on its science, but maybe it could do a bit more on the arts too. Okay, um, yes, gentlemen over here, please. I'm Hara, uh, thank you for your uh, nice uh, presentation. Uh, maybe because of my inability to understand English, uh, my question might be overlapped with uh, what the Mr. Kurt uh, questioned about Iran. Mm -hmm. My question is about the UK's border issue with Iran. Mm -hmm. How your country is going to solve uh, this issue? because it's a very hard nut to crack, for UK to crack, mm. in addition to economic or political issues. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. I think in, in answering his question, I have described what our um, intentions are. I don't think I've gone quite as far as your question, which is what precisely is the answer that we're going to come up with. I mean, the result that we want is not to have physical borders. Yeah. So. There are all sorts of things that you can do uh, around that, particularly when you're moving goods. There are things you can do in terms of the way that um, goods are um, identified electronically as they move around the country and so on. So I'm not sure what the final solution is going to be, but I think because there is such um, goodwill on both sides, um, because we have technical solutions available, that it should be possible that we're, we're able to, to solve this one. And of course Ireland is, itself is, is, is part of an island, so uh, the external borders for Ireland are, um, are controlled by the Irish government. So there, there is only um, one border for each of those countries between, between themselves. So it ought to be something that we can come up with a solution on. But what exactly the nature of that solution is, I think I can't say at this stage. Um. Just, just quickly, for me, one more, the last one from me, I promise. Um, Japan excels at manufacturing skills, monotsukuri. Um, they are absolutely superb in that regard. I remember that when Mrs. May came to power, I think she said she intended to revive some of Britain's manufacturing skills. Do you think that is actually happening or likely to happen? Uh, well, she hasn't been in power for that long, so it's probably too early to see some of the um, results in, in, in that sphere because, of course, what you're talking about are long-term investments uh, in, in, in infrastructure and long-term investments in education and skills training. Um, actually, both Britain and Japan share a challenge of relatively low productivity compared to some other um, advanced countries. And the key to that, some of it is um, 
innovation and in, in investment in things, but some of it's investment in, in education and skills. We've seen a big expansion in the university sector in the, the last few years. Um, we're trying to match that now with investment in um, technology skills, the skills that young people need in the workplace, um, apprenticeships and so on. And we're, we're certainly seeing a growth in that. It will take, of course, some time for those skills to come through and be used across people's working lives. But it's, it's an area of priority now. Of course, many people are working in the, the services sector rather than manufacturing. But there are also um, important needs in the services sector, too, to, um, to improve productivity. OK, well, I think we're about at the end of our time, actually, three minutes from the end of our time. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for coming, taking time out of your busy schedule to come and talk to us. We hope this won't be the last time. And to encourage you to come again, I'd like to give you a, a free one-year honorary, one honorary membership of the club. Thank, thank you. you very much indeed. Thanks.